Uh, without further ado, I'll announce the first talk of the day, uh, which is by our very own Wayne Merville from Philosophy Department at the University of Western Ontario. And he's going to be speaking to us today about the Maxwellian view of statistical mechanics and thermodynamics. OK, good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming. Um, yeah, so the, the theme of this conference is thermodynamics as a resource theory. And that suggests that there is such a thing, such a category of theories as resource theories. And for those of you, this will be very familiar to some people in the audience, maybe less so to others. For those of you who aren't famil familiar with it, um, what we've seen in the past few years is the development of an idea that there's a sort of general uh, framework for um, resource theories um, which have to do with um, you know, the ways in which agents like us um, can use um, information about and physical properties of certain um, physical systems in order to accomplish certain kinds of tasks. And it's a, it's a burgeoning field, and it's the sort of thing that, yeah, um, that people are, are writing um, review papers already about because there's en enough going on. And I just became aware of, of this, which just went up on the archive last week, um, a survey article about quantum resource theories. One quantum resource theory, one obvious one, is quantum information theory. So quantum information theory, actually, um, I guess um, there's a sentence in the abstract that I like. QRTs, quantum resource theories, revolutionize the way we think about familiar properties of physical systems like entanglement, elevating them from just being interesting from a fundamental point of view. Not just interesting from a fundamental point of view, but more importantly, um, useful in performing practical tasks. So you know, I, I, I like that. In, in particular, this is something that I wish more um, physicists, I'm sorry, more philosophers to pay attention to because um, you know, um, too often philosophers want to say, well, you know, tell me what's fundamental. That's what's really interesting. Everything else is uninteresting. And I'm hoping people will realize that resource theories are very interesting. So quantum information is largely about how we can use various um, properties of quantum systems, such as entanglement, to do tasks that you wouldn't be able to do if you didn't have them. Um, but if you think about it, thermodynamics can be thought of as a theory about how you can use non-equilibrium as a resource to do things, useful tasks like performing work. And what I want to do in this talk is um, just put that into historical perspective, because that is not a new idea. Um, that was precisely how Maxwell thought about um, thermodynamics. So um, there's going to be no new ideas in this. In fact, there will be no ideas in this that are um, less than 100 something years old. But I'm hoping they'll be new to some of you. OK. There's James Clark Maxwell with his color wheel. All right. Um, we're talking about thermodynamics. Um, one of the earliest formulations of what um, Kelvin was later to call the second law of thermodynamics is the Clausius form formulation, um, 1854. He cannot pass from a colder b body to a warmer body without some other change chart connected with it occurring at the same time. Can't, can't happen. No spontaneous um, passage of heat from a cold or w warmer body. You have to do something. It's spontaneous. You have to do something to get it to, um, um, to, do, to do that. So you can't have a cyclic process whose only effect is to transfer heat from a um, colder body to a warming body. OK. Now what happened not long after that is that people like Clausius, like Maxwell, like others, who are working simultaneously on thermodynamics and also on the relatively new subject, this kinetic theory of gases, the then radical proposal that um, gases were composed of lots of mo molecules bouncing around. Um, 
came to realize that that cannot, cannot be exactly right. Um, because um, if there's things bouncing around more or less at random, randomly, they could, even if it's fairly rare, spontaneously result in, in heat transfer from a, um, a um, colder uh, body to a um, warmer body. And um, there's a familiar, and, and so probabilities were, into, and, and were brought into the subject, and the subject that we now call statistical mechanics got born. Now, there's a familiar story that I'm sure you've all heard on your mother's knee when she's reading you the Aaron Fisk's encyclopedia article on the foundations of statistical mechanics about where pro how probabilities got into the subject. The familiar story uh, um, is the story of our, you know, the, 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 you know the, the knight who goes astray and gets rede redeemed, the hero Boltzmann. And Boltzmann, in 1872, published um, what um, has come to be known as the H theorem. It's called the H theorem because um, Boltzmann called the quantity, quantity in question capital eta because it reminded him of entropy. We ought to be calling it an eta theorem, but don't, because like, even though that would be correct, um, if you go talking about the eta theorem, then people will have no idea what you're talking about, because that actually is a capital eta. Um, Poches is H theorem, which gives the impression that he can derive for, an I, for a, um, a gas of molecules colliding, um, he can derive from, that, from, from the mechanics of collisions alone um, a conclusion that if it starts out with a distribution of velocity different from the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, it'll head towards it. Monotonic relaxation to equilibrium. A couple years later, Lo Schmitz famously pointed out to them that, that cannot possibly be right. Because the dynamics um, that um, he was use, invoking were time reversal invariant. And that means if, a, any, pro, if any process is dynamically possible, it's, it's temporal inverse is also dynamically possible. So if a approach to equilibrium is consistent with the mechanics, so is a move away from e equilibrium. And that kind of came as a, a shock to um, Boltzmann, and he thought about it, and eventually came to the idea that, OK, there are probabilistic considerations being surreptitiously invoked in the H theorem, silently invoked in the H theorem. And what we should, really should say is that approach to equilibrium is probable, with other behavior being dynamically possible, but less probable. Okay. That's a familiar story, I hope, to, to a lot of you. And it's true, but it leaves out an awful lot. And what it leaves out is that Boltzmann is very late to the party on this conclusion. Okay. Um, a decade before Boltzmann comes to this, makes his probabilistic term, um, James Clark Maxwell is writing a letter to his good friend Peter Guthrie Tate. Tate was also interested in thermodynamics. And uh, Tate was a very good friend of William Thompson, of both Maxwell and William Thompson, um, who was later to become Lord Kelvin. They're, you know, they're also friends with, um, with um, Lord Rayleigh and all these other people who are contributing to this. So, um, and there's lots of letters between these guys. So he writes a, a letter to um, Tate. Tate is working on a book that would be eventually published as his sketch of thermodynamics. And Maxwell is giving him advice on it. And one of the th th things that Maxwell um, suggests is, well, you know, I think you might want to pick a hole in the second law of thermodynamics. That's Maxwell's abbreviation for thermodynamics. And he proceeds to explain why he thinks that the second law of thermodynamics can't be strictly true. 
And he proceeds to outline what we, eventually, we now call Maxwell's demon. This is the first appearance of, of the demon. That you can imagine an agent um, taking advantage of the fact that in the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, there are not everything at the same velocity, and um, using a movable um, um, par partition separating out the hotter and colder molecules in the gas. And he concludes, in short, if heat is the motion of finite propor portions of matter, and if we can apply tools to such portions of matter so as to deal with them separately, then we can take advantage of the different motions of different proportions to restore a uniform hot system to unequal temperatures or to motions of large masses. Of course, that's a big if. And then he says, only we can't, um, uh, I'm sorry, I've got the comma in the wrong place. We can't, comma, not being clever enough. Okay. Now, what, what happens next is interesting because um, somebody on that, wrote on that letter in pencil, very good. Another way is to reverse the motion of every particle in the universe and preside over the unstable mo motion this produces. So the idea that um, of velocity reversal, you change the velocities of everything and, every, and everything just, just proceed, proceeds um, um, backwards um, is already there in that penciled anno annotation. And that's the um, essence of um, Loschmidt's reversibility reject objection to um, Boltzmann. Um, that letter, um, parts of that letter were first p published in 1912 um, in or sorry, 1911, I think, in um, Life and Scientific Work of Peter Guthrie Tate. The editor of that volume attributed it, it to Kelvin. More recently, um, uh, um, editors of very distinguished um, historians um, who edited um, various collections of Maxwell's writing say they think that the handwriting looks more, more, more like Tate's. So we don't know who first formulated the reversibility argument. It was either Thompson or, or, or Tate. Um, it gets spelled out a few years later in a letter from, um, from um, Maxwell to um, Lord Rayleigh. And I love this. I love the way this letter starts. Dear Strutt, then no, how are you? Hope you're well, life's your kids. Dear Strutt, if this world is a purely dynamical system, and if you accurately reserve, reverse the motion of every particles of it at the same instant, then all things will happen backwards to the beginning of things. The raindrops will collect themselves from the ground and fly up to the clouds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And men will see their friends passing from the grave to the cradle till we ourselves become the reverse of born, whatever that is. We shall then speak of the impossibility of knowing about the past except by analogies taken from the future. But I don't think it requires such a feat to upset the second law of thermodynamics. And then he proceeds to describe the demon. So you don't have to reverse everything. Um, more limited um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, abilities of manipulation could um, produce violations of the second law of thermodynamics. Um, and then he drives the moral. Second law of thermodynamics has the same degree of truth as the statement that if you throw a tumble full of water into the sea, you cannot get the same tumble full of water out again. Which is true. As long as you in in interpret that can't as, well, gee, it would be this ridiculously improbable coincidence. So improbable that we can ignore, we can ignore the, the possibility that it happens but not actually dynamically impossible, not actually a violation of the, um, of the fundamental laws of physics. Okay. And um, similarly, um, Gibbs himself, um, where he, he's considering um, the um, entropy of mixing. If you have two di um, different gases initially confined to a um, different parts of a, a um, 
of, of, of a container by a partition and then pull it out. As long as the gases are different, so they're allowed to diffuse into each other. As long as they're different, you have an increase of entropy. But they're bouncing around and they could spontaneously separate again. And um, that would be a decrease in entropy. And so what Gibbs concludes in 1875, impossibility of an uncompensated decrease of entropy seems to be reduced to improbability. So, um, uh, um, well before Boltzmann, well, you know, before, before Boltzmann came to this realization, basically everyone else who was working on the, on, on the theory came, um, came to the real, real, real realization. Boltzmann was the last major, major figure to, um, re to realize that. And in fact, um, there's this great letter from um, Maxwell to um, Tate from 1873, where he's ridiculing Clausius and, and um, and Boltzmann, who are arguing over who had priority for proving that the second law of thermodynamics follows from Hamiltonian dynamics. And um, yeah, he, um, he, he, um, there's some lovely ridicule in that, uh, in, in the, 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 that letter. Um, yeah, so. By the way, I may actually mention this. You might be. Um, Thinking, hold on, what's he t what were these guys talking about violations about the second law? We still learn the second law is, is correct. And here's what happened, is that um, the original formulation, as we saw from Clausius, and there's um, equivalent formulations, they all have a can't or cannot, you know, or it is impossible in it. And that was um, originally, as originally conceived, thought to be strictly true. This was supposed to be a law. This was supposed to be an impossibility. What um, we get taught these days as the second law of thermodynamics is something of, is a statistical uh, um, version. Something like, OK, yeah, the fluctuations will uh, um, occasionally lead to differences in Heat content from the from, from, or you know energy content to, in regions of a gas where that was originally more or less uni uniform, but they're kind of unpredictable and we can't reliably harness them to 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 do work, and so what people usually think about um, the second law of thermodynamics has to do with expectation values of heat transfer and 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 work done, and so. Um, What's happened is um, we've, we formulated a substitute that we do think is, is true, but it actually is not the same as the original um, version, which um, in the 1870s, people were realizing um, if the kinetic theory of gases couldn't be, you know, uh, you know, could, um, um, could not, was true, couldn't be strictly true. Okay, so um, eventually um, in, um, Tate um, publishes his sketch of thermodynamics. As you may, may recall, um, Maxwell was, while Tate was writing it, giving Tate advice on how to handle certain things, including here's how you should deal with the second law of thermodynamics. And in 1878, he reviews um, the book in, uh, um, uh, um, for Nature, and he says, the the t real test of any book on thermodynamics is handled by, is, 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 is how it handles the second law. And this book gets it right. And um, here you know, he, he explicitly says um, that the second law as originally conceived is going to be violated. And this, so this is, um, um, this is an interesting shift because earlier um, Maxwell and others were saying, well, okay, if we could have these ridiculously uh, um, precise pos possibilities of manipulation, we could produce violations of the second law. Here, Maxwell um, is saying, well, actually, on the, on the micro level, small violations of the second law are happening. You know, this isn't hypothetical. Small violations of the second law are actually happening all the time. So if we consider a finite group of finite number of molecules, the average property of this group, though subject to smaller variation than those of a single molecule, are still every now and then deviating very considerably from the theoretical mean of the whole system. 
because the molecules which form the group do not submit their procedure as individuals to the laws which prescribe the behavior of the average or mean molecule. So here he's, he's saying, okay, you, you, you can compute ex expectation values. Then, of course, there's going to be actually fluctuations around those expectation values. Hence, the second law of thermodynamics is continually being violated, and that to a considerable extent in any sufficiently small group of molecules belonging to a real body. So for him, the second law of thermodynamics was a statistical truth in exactly the same sense, or it was a statistical law. Um, and what he meant with a statistical law is not necessarily a probabilistic law, but one that is true if you look at the average on a, on a large enough population. Um, early in the 19th century, um, the science that we now call statistics was born. It was not part of the math department then. It was part of the social sciences. If you were working in statistics in the first half of the 19th century, what you were doing was collecting statistics. You were collecting data about a um, society, how many births, how many deaths, how many, you know, you know, how many instances of a certain disease within a, a, a age range. And as people were compiling these statistics, they were noticing that for an awful lot of things that are individually unpredictable, the, um, in a large enough population, the number of, per year, for example, would be more or less constant. So number of violent crimes in a given city in a year tended to be more or less constant. Um, of course, individual, um, instant, individual uh, um, instances of that are going to be unpredictable by their very nature, right? If the cops could predict when a violent crime was going to occur, then it wouldn't. Um, so, um, but on average, they were more or less um, constant. And so when, he, when Maxwell talks about statistical regularity, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the sort of thing that, uh, that uh, the, the, the sort of regularities that stem from laws of large numbers and, th and, and things like that. Regularities that are more or less reliable when dealing with large numbers and not necessarily with small numbers of things. Um, probability didn't get um, really, um, didn't really become central to um, statistics until like, the 1880s. All right. OK. All right, so the, continuing, um, this calculation belongs, of course, to the molecular theory, not to pure thermodynamics. But it shows that we have reason for believing the truth of the second law to be of the nature of a strong probability. So as mentioned, um, the version of the second law, when people, you know, because we haven't abandoned the second law, the version of the second law that um, I think that most physicists would adhere to today is something of the form that, uh, you know, um, uh, and this makes no pre pretense to precision, is, you know, even though that they say in a gas or any other substance there'll be local fluctuations in the energy in a given region or the density, there's no process that consistently or reliably exploits them to transfer heat to a core cooler to a warmer body without producing a compensating increase in entropy elsewhere. Something like that. Um, another quote from Maxwell, this is from his Theory of Heat, the book published in 1871. Um, One of the best established facts in thermodynamics is it's impossible in a system enclosed in an envelope which permits neither change of volume nor passage of heat, I, a, 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 a diabatically isolated, in which both the temperature and pressure are ever the same to produce any inequality of temperature or pressure without the expenditure of work. This is the second law of dynamics and is undoubtedly true as long as we can deal with those bodies only in mass and have no power of perceiving the separate molecules of which they're made up. That's a key qualification for him. But if we conceive of being whose faculties are so sharpened that he can follow every molecule in his course, such a being whose attributes are still as essentially as fine as their own would be able to do what is at present post impossible to us. He then just des describes the, the, um, what we call the Maxwell demon. He says, the thus without an expenditure of work raise the temperature of B and lower that of A in contrast to the second law of thermodynamics. I think he's answering, he says, 
it would be able to do what is at present impossible to us. He's, he, he's not claiming that there's any in principle limitation on the ability to build a machine that could do this. He just says, we, we don't know how to do it. Um, OK. So in one of the instances when conclusions we have drawn from our experience of bodies consisting of an immense number of molecules may be found not to be applicable to the more delicate observations and experiments we suppose made by one who can perceive and handle the individual molecules which you can deal with only in large masses. And I find this interesting because one of the things that's happening in the, in, in the, resort, in, in the um, recent work in quantum thermodynamics is work on how the second law needs to be modified when you're dealing with um, systems consisting of, of uh, uh, only a um, few atoms. All right. OK, I already said that. OK. So this was actually, we're used to this, but this was actually a um, radical innovation um, in, in physics at the time that Maxwell, instead of trying to track, you know, consider, think of a gas and solve the n body problem for where n is the number of molecules, um, you know, he says, well, what I'm going to do is, well, what do statisticians do when they get a bunch of data? They're not particularly interested in exactly when this person died or when that person died. What they do is they throw away an awful lot of information and, and, and bin it. They say, Here, you know, here's the number of um, people be within a certain age group who died in a certain degree in, 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 a, in, a, in a certain year. And similarly, Maxwell, you know, if you think of you know, what's the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, it tells you how many molecules in the, in the gas have their, have their velocities within, within a certain, certain range. And it, I think it was a real innovation on Maxwell's part to, to, to see that when it comes to systems like that, that's, that's an interesting thing to, um, to be talking about. All right. OK. So for Maxwell, even the probable truth of the second law is limited to situations in which the molecules are dealt with not individually but en masse. So um, he's open to the possibility that um, there might be some kind of process or might be possible to construct a, mach a machine to, to, um, to um, do the sorts of things that the Maxwell um, uh, um, demon is supposed to do. OK. All right. Now, one thing that happens when I, and you probably experienced this, I certainly have, um, when you start talking about thermodynamics uh, as a resource theory, people say, hold it, wait. This is physics. You can't bring agents into physics. Physics is about the physical world. So I want to talk a bit about what, the, um, what, what, what thermodynamics is about. Um, the word thermodynamics um, has got thermo in it, it's got dynamics in it. It's formed from two Greek words. And I think a lot of people, um, because when you, when you, if, if I'm studying dynamics, that you mean, usually means you're studying the equations of motion of some system. A lot of people, I think, assume that thermodynamics is supposed to mean the dynamics of heat, maybe like, uh, um, the science of how heat goes from one place to another. Now, as a matter of fact, Fourier and Kelvin and others um, did say study the heat, you know, heat flow equations and stuff like that, and they did not use the word thermodynamics for that. Thermodynamics was coined from the Greek word from heat and for power. And the, um, if, if you look at um, the early treatises, and, um, it was actually Kelvin who introduced the term, it's absolutely clear that what is meant by that term is it's the study of the interchangeability or, uh, of, of heat and work. Right. So, um, and you know, fundamental to the um, to thermodynamics is there's two ways in which energy can be um, uh, transferred between um, two 
to, to, to systems by doing, you know, doing work or by heat transfer. And the first law, of course, is all, says that the net energy transfer is, is going to be, um, yeah. net energy is conserved if you take both work into, and, and, and heat into account. Second law in all of its formulations requires the distinction between those two modes of energy transfer, if you think about it. And so, well, and here's what Maxwell um, found himself thinking. Well, on the kinetic theory, what is the distinction between doing heat transfer and doing work? Because um, on this theory, heat isn't some kind of fluid that flows from one body to another. Heat has to do with the motion of things. And um, so heat transfer is molecules bouncing each other and imparting, imparting um, kinetic energy to, to, to each other. Well, gee, and work consists of moving you know, parts of a system and um, transferring energy to it. So what's the difference? And um, Maxwell's answer is, well, really, if you're going to make a distinction between work and heat, you are at least implicitly making a distinction between those degrees of freedom in the system that you can keep, keep track of and manipulate and, and those that you can't. There's, here's a, a um, nice picture from um, a popular book by Peter Atkins called The Four Laws of Drive the Universe. He says, the molecular distinction between transfer of energy is work and heat. Doing work results in the uniform motion of atoms and surroundings. Heat, heat, heating stimulates their disorderly motion. That can't really be taken as a definition, but that's a nice picture to have in mind. Yeah. So from that also review, he says, we have only to suppose our senses sharpened to such a degree that we could trace the motions of molecules as easy as we now trace those of large bodies, and the distinction between work and heat would vanish. For the communication of heat would be seen to, to be a communication of energy of the same kind as that we call work. That was a fairly revolutionary thing to say. Because what he's saying is, you know, at the fundamental level, you know, if you ignore limitations on information about a system, the distinction between heat and work vanishes. The laws, I just said a moment ago that, that um, thermodynamics, the science of thermodynamics, is fundamentally about interconversion of heat and work. So at the fundamental level, Maxwell is saying, thermodynamics vanishes. It's not a science of fundamental physics. It's a science um, about how beings like us, with limited access, epistemic access, and um, limited um, manipulation abilities uh, to manipulate things, can use our, the information we do have about the system in order to manipulate it and perform certain tasks. OK. And here's from his Encyclopedia Britannica article on diffusion. Available energy is energy which we can direct, direct into any des desired channel. Dissipated energy, you know, what, you know, what happens when you have a thermodynamically irreversible process is some energy is dissipated, it's, you know, energy is conserved so the energy um, isn't gone, but it's no longer in a useful form. Dissipated energy is energy we cannot lay hold of and direct at pleasure, such as the energy of the confused agitation of molecules, we, which we call heat. Now, confusion, like the correlative term order, is not a property of material things in themselves, but only a relation to the mind that precedes them. Here's a nice analogy. A random, random book does not, provided it's neatly written, appear confused to an illiterate person or to the owner who understands it thoroughly, but to any other person able to read it appears to be inextricably confused. And it, maybe it's not clear what that um, metaphor means because I don't, a lot of us don't take, we don't have memorandum books. Um, but um, this is something you encounter if you read the letters between Maxwell and, and, and Tate. They had their own private abbreviations for things. They had their own private jokes. We've already seen, seen, seen um, he, uh, um, uh, uh, um, that you know, he'll um, abbreviate thermodynamics as that. 
Sometimes he abbreviates it as, as, as that. Um, and um, he, he, he um, signs his name DP by DT because um, there's some equation which, which is DP by DT equals KCM. I don't remember something. Uh, right. um, yeah, so it's, 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 it's like, you know, the, these letters between, between Maxwell and Tate would, would, would um, in some passages, seem like nonsense um, for th someone who, do, do, who, who, who doesn't get it. And a lot of people would, for their own memorandum books, you know, develop, develop their own shorthand or code or something like that. So what he's saying is, look, if you have, you know, an illiterate person looking at this the memorandum book says, okay, that's nice and neatly written. And someone who understands it says, okay, yeah, that makes sense. But to someone who can read the letters but not understand the code, it'll just seem like nonsense. That's what he's saying. Similarly, the notion of dissipation of energy could not occur to a being who could not turn any of the energies of nature to his own account or to the one who could trace the motion of every molecule and sees it at the right moment. So if there's no limitation, if you could conceive of a being with no limitations on its ability to gain information for free about a system, and no limitations on its ability to manipulation, the notion of dissipated energy, the distinction between heat and work, would not occur to such a being. Um, also, if you couldn't do anything at all, if you had no ability to manipulate, that was, you wouldn't need such a notion. It's only that being in the intermediate stage, us, who can do some manipulations, um, but not others, that um, this is, a, for, for us, that's a useful concept. Energy being passing inevitably from the available to the dissipated state. All right. OK. So the uh, view of the remark is, um, he says it's relative to the mind that per perceives it. And I know some people these days say the things like entropy, distinction between heat and work is, is subjective, and therefore entropy is subjective. Um, I think what is meant is correct, but I think it's also misleading. Because subjective, um, to some people, suggests that it can vary arbitrarily from, to, to, from person to person. Um, and what it's relative to is not who you are or what your whims are or what mood you are in, in the day, but what sort of means you have available to you. What sort of, right, right. So um, I think that a um, better way to put it is it's means relative. Um, and as a consequence, you know, if, the definition of entropy um, in thermodynamics is if you've got two equilibrium states and you want to know the entr entropy difference between them, imagine some reversible process that goes from one to another and ask yourself how much heat enters or leaves the system um, in the process and the entropy difference is defined by that. So if I'm going to define the entropy difference between two states, I need to know what to put in here for dq, which means I need to know which energy transfers in and out of the system are heat and which are work. And if the um, distinction between heat and work is um, means relative, then the entropy is also. OK. Um, so a Maxwell demon capable of infinitely fine manipulations and able to keep track of motions all molecules would need neither thermodynamics nor statistical mechanics on the Maxwellian view. OK. So Maxwell's view is that thermodynamics is the science of how beings such as us with limited knowledge of the system, limited means of manipulation, can use that knowledge as a resource to perform useful work. When I talk to philosophers these days, and some of you may have encountered this when talking to physicists, People say, that's nuts. And this is a you know, good example of, um, you know, from, 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 for the literature from a book that um, has been very influential in the philosophical literature on statistical mechanics. Um, for those of you who know David Albert, you have to imagine this being read in David Albert's voice. I, I, I really can't do it. Let's try to keep our heads on. 
The sort of me entropy we're attempting to get in the bottom of here, remember, is the entropy that we ran into into thermodynamics. And thermodynamics is, entropy is patently an attribute of individual systems. And attributes of individual systems can patently be nothing other than attributes of their individual microconditions. OK, on this view of thermodynamics, entropy is not nothing other than attributes of the individual microsystems. Of course, it has, um, you know, it's not un unrelated to the actual microstate of, 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 of a system. Um, but you know, it's it, you know, it, 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 it's it, it, you you have to bring in other considerations. Also, you'll find similar statements, say, in the writings of Shelley Goldstein. Um, these people um, adopt um, what they call, what's called a Neo-Boltzmannian view of statistical mechanics. I believe that. As they define entropy, it's still not true that it's nothing other than an attribute of the microconditions micro the way we talk about. All right. So, um, what can I say? I think that um, thermodynamics as a resource theory is an old idea whose time has come. I think that it's a time for philosophers to pay more attention to it, which is why I organized this conference. Thank you. So, um, so the, exa the example that um, uh, um, Gibbs was talking about when I, I had that quote um, had to do with um, the diffusion of, 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 ga of gases and um, actually I had more detail. I left those slides, those slides out. Um, but anyways, but yeah. So the the idea is, you know, imagine I've got. You know, initially two gases confined um, to a um, by a partition to different parts, and then you know you remove the partition and you let them interdiffuse. <laughs> now, if you didn't know any differences between the gas on, on the left and the gas on the right, in particular, if there was no difference that you could you, that you could manipulate. And this is all out of uh, let's, the, and the, let's say they start out to the same temperature and, pre and pressure, then you would say, yeah, uh, um, final state and um, initial state and final state, th same thermodynamic state, no entropy um, increase. Whereas, suppose actually now you do know a difference between the two, and moreover, it's a difference that you can exploit to do work. Then. And the um, textbook um, illustration, which actually goes back to Boltzmann, of this is, you know, imagine I had a piston um, which um, you know, these guys bounced off, uh, um, um, you know, these guys bounced off of it and um, these guys you know, didn't, and I had another you know, piston which was the other way. You know, I could slowly expand this gas, use that expansion to, 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 uh, to, um, uh, um, to, to, to raise a weight, keep it in, in contact with a, a heat bath to keep it at the same temperature, and do work while, while heat um, go, goes into the system, and do the other thing. And then you calculate the entropy in, increase. So um, um, if I thought of the um, um, if I thought of the initial state and final states as the same thermodynamic state, as someone who didn't know of any uh, know that difference, then I say, okay, well, wow, you did magic. Um, you um, 
you, um, uh, um, you, uh, um, you violated the, se the, the, the second law of thermodynamics. You got to you know, work out of the system without changing its thermodynamic state. Is that paradoxical? Um, well, if your view is that um, the entropy that is to be ascribed to a thermodynamic state is um, tied up with these means relative considerations, then no, it's not. Then it shouldn't be regarded as paradoxical. That's just, you know, that's just a view. Yeah. So um, if you think that the um, thermodynamic, that the entropy of a given state is supposed to be nothing other than a property of its physical state, then it would seem paradoxical to you. Yeah, 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 and they use the same examples too. They they use the the you know, uh, entropy of mixing, diffusion, and stuff like that. Yeah, yep. Yeah, let me, yeah, let me just explain that. Um, let me just put the quote, the, the quote back up. Oops. I went too far. Okay, so... When David Howard Kelly Goldstein says that um, entropy is patently an attribute of the microstate of an individual system, what do they mean? And they call this the Boltzmannian um, um, approach to, to um, statistical mechanics. I like the term neo-Boltzmannian better because, um, as Yo Su think has pointed out, every approach to statistical mechanics that you can think of is there in Boltzmann. Um, Boltz, sometimes in the same paper, Boltzmann was was very opportunistic. Um, his um, um, he, um, you know he, he would use whatever techniques he thought was relevant to a to a problem. One of the things that um, Albert and Goldstein like to they like to play up the difference between Gibbsian and Boltzmannian statistical mechanics. And they say, well, yeah, and, and that's the reason for this talk about individual systems, because Gibbs involved ensembles of systems whose microstates um, differ, and um, uh, uh, but all have the same the, the, the same macrostate. If you want to clearly convey to people that you have never ever even glanced at Gibbs's book then you say, that's the big difference between Boltzmann and Gibbs. Because on the very first page of the preface, Gibbs says, I got this idea of ensembles from Boltzmann. And if you go through um, uh, um, uh, um, that book, it's awfully short on citations. It's like six authors that get cited, and Boltzmann is, is, is the one who gets cited the, the most. Um, yeah, so on the Neo-Boltzmannian view, um, they tend to talk about isolated systems a lot, even though most of the systems we're interested in in thermodynamics are in contact with a um, heat bath. And so you, so you can c consider um, the um, energy surface, call it lambda, for a, for a isolated system with a given fi fi fixed f a, a given energy. You consider the um, the um, uh, um, energy surface of that, and you divide it up into macrostates, which are presumably 
things that you know you you, you pick out you pick a number of macro variables, and macro states are ones that, within the tolerances you're concerned with, agree on those macro variables. And then you um, impose you 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 take the microcanonical distribution on that um, on that energy surface. And you calculate the um, measure in, in microcanonical measure um, of the various macrostates. And you say, so here's a macrostate, you know, M1, M2, M3. And you say, okay, well, if the system's state is in this macrostate, then um, the entropy is um, proportional to the you know, the, 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 the entropy is proportional to the log of the microcanonical measure of that microstate. There, entropy is a property of the microstate. Well, hold on, wait. In order to get this, you know, and there's, there's the microstate. In order to get this, you 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 you, you, did, you added um, a couple of things to the bare fundamental physical position. First of all, you picked out a certain set of macro variables. Presumably, those are the ones we have access to. You partitioned the um, the energy surface into um, macro states, which are close enough in all their macro variables. There's, you know, so, so how close is close enough? Well, presumably our tolerance for, you know, or, you know that has to do with the distinctions we can make or, uh, um, or the distinctions are relative, relevant to our, our, our concerns. And you brought in a measure on, 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 the, on the state space. So you, so you added a choice of macro variables um, a level, level of tolerance and a measure in the state space and all that equipment goes into um, defining that quantity. So no, it's not a property of the microstate alone. Hi. Yeah. Uh, so you, I will put your talk, you mentioned that uh, if you can describe the system at the level of the individual molecules, the dynamics disappears. So yeah. the question is, what happens to, so thermodynamics disappears, what happens to statistical mechanics? Does it also disappear? Does it just become classical mechanics? Or is there something else? Um, um, yeah, so statistical mechanics. Um, yeah, so here's, here's the picture. Um, fundamental level, you've got you know, so a system with some kind of state space, and you've got laws of evolution on the state space, and um, a level of fundamental physics, that's all there is. Statistical mechanics um, as the name suggests, has to do, we're not trying to track the, um, the um, precise microstate, your um, Abstra throwing away information, you're abstracting a bit. You're, you might say, okay, I'm not interested in the precise microstate of the gas, but I am interested in um, the distribution of velocities, for example. Um, and so you're choosing some set of variables that you're interested in. And also, um, what, you, what you're doing when you're doing statistical mechanics is you're putting a probability distribution on the state space and um, um, and tracking evolution of you know, how 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 that changes under various pro processes. So that's what, yeah. So yeah. So um, I think the picture that emerges is that and um, and actually this is um, yeah. There's a there, there, there's a nice precedent to this. So. Um, Laplace, when he's writing his philosophical essay on probabilities, in the very first pages, he, he feels like he needs to explain, or he thinks he needs to explain to the readers um, 
what is, why is there any such science of probability at all? In the deterministic universe, why is anyone writing a treatise on probability? And he tells that, f that now famous um, parable, if there were a being, an intelligence so vast that it knew the precise microstate of the, of, of, of the world, and if it knew the laws of nature, and if it could do the calculation, well, it would know everything about past and future. Such a being would not have no use whatsoever for a, a, any science of probability. This book is not written for the, that being. That's not the intended audience of this book. The intended audience is, of, of the book is you, the reader, who has limited knowledge of, uh, of, of the state of the universe, limited and limited abilities of, 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 of calculation. So on Laplace's view, so, I mean, at the fundamental level, from the point of view of this hypothetical being, there would be no need for any talk of probability. And I think Maxwell would probably agree. Um, the demon, is not, Maxwell's demon is awful lot like Laplace's demon. If it knows everything, it doesn't need to talk about probabilities of it or anything. So um, what, we, what we do in statistical mechanics is we invoke probability measures typically over the state base of the system. And I mean, something interesting happens in there because um, usually in the introductory chapters of a statistical mechanics textbook, it says, the reason that we're introducing probabilities into the subject is that these systems have many degrees of freedom. We, can't, we, we couldn't know the exact microstate, and even if we could, we couldn't keep track of its evolution. Um, so that suggests a sort of epistemic reading of these probabilities. But what, what's kind of interesting then is that you, that you then make posits about appropriate probabilities for um, equilibrium various equilibrium distributions, and then say, well, these posits are ultimately justified on the basis of experiment. And I think that's sort of interesting because um, tension, because there is an epistemic and a physical aspect to, um, to um, these things. Yeah, so um, from the point of view of fundamental physics, um, yeah. Thermodynamics vanishes, statistical mechanics vanishes, no, no need to talk about um, probability. Um, that, of course, is on the assumption that the laws of physics are deterministic, which is something that just Laplace and uh, Maxwell um, and um, everybody um, take for granted. And you know, Shelley Goldstein and David Albert, too. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Maxwell. It sounds not uh, so inconsistent with that. Um, yeah, so um, <coughs> yeah, like he, um, he, yeah, he, remember he, he, he said this, this demon is going to, you know, we at presently deal with systems only in bulk. We don't have the ability to, um, to manipulate individual molecules. Um, he does seem to imagine some kind of future possible uh, advances in which we would be able to do that, in which you ca case you would have to extend the picture to take into account um, systems like you know, single molecule heat engines and, 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 um, and, and, thing, and things like that. So. Um, it's not clear to me whether he thinks that thermodynamic concepts are still going to apply in that regime or not. But I think he'd be open to an extension to that regime. It doesn't sound like he would dispute the yeah. idea that if you have to talk about means, yeah. then we ought to talk about the memory storage capacities of the demon, because that determines the means of the demon. And therefore, right. if you tell me that the amount of work I can do yeah. depends on how yeah. much memory I yeah. have initialized, well, that's perfectly consistent. Yeah, I, think, I do think so. I, I, I do think so, yeah. Um, so he talks about, um, as far as I know, Maxwell doesn't ever explicitly mention means of storage of information. Um, he talks about means of, of 
perception and information gathering. Obviously, information is no good for good to you if you immediately forget it, right? if, you, if you don't have any means of storing it. Um, so I think he would be sympathetic to that kind of way, way of thinking. Describe the Maxwellian view of physical mechanics and thermodynamics, and you uh, you said you want to advocate for it in the sense that you want to mm -hmm. pay attention to it. So I'm just wondering if you could speculate or maybe do more than speculate as to why it was it seems to have been ignored. Um, um good question. Um I say one thing that's a little less speculative and one thing that's a little um, more spec speculative. Um, it's hard to overestimate the impact of the Aaron Fest's encyclopedia article, which got translated in English and published as a little Dover um, paperback, as um, on, on, on discussions of the, of, of the foundation of statistical mechanics. And that's where that's the, you know, that, um, and, and, and um, there's a lot that's really good in it, and uh, there's a lot that's very clear. But it's for one of its, but historical accuracy is not one of its virtues. What they're doing there, Boltzmann is the hero. And um, um, when, at the time, Boltzmann had been their teacher, and, he, and, and um, at, at the time they read it, he was supposed to be the one who, who wrote it, but he passed away under, uh, you know, he committed suicide. And, it, and it's really meant to be a tribute to them. And so as a consequence, Boltzmann's predecessors get short shrift, and Gibbs is the idiot American who can't do anything right. Um, and, um, and, and that's why, you know, you notice I use the word the reversibility argument. Um, so this is an argument for the conclusion that we have to, use to that um, what the original version of the statistical law, uh, uh, the, the um, original version of the second law of thermodynamics is impossible, has to be regarded as only Im improbable. And that's just a conclusion that Maxwell and others accepted. In the literature, you'll hear the phrase with reversibility objection. Because um, Loesch misraised an objection to an um, erroneous claim on the part of um, on Boltzmann. And um, so I think you get this distorted view um, uh, um, of the foundations of, of statistical mechanics if you base it too heavily on, on, on that book. Um, for some reason, um, people who do write about Maxwell tend to focus on the demon and how to exercise it. You know, how, how would we, um, uh, how can we show that this demon is in fact impossible? And I think a lot of people don't realize that actually Maxwell just was kind of leaving it open whether this kind of manipulation would be possible or, or, or not. And so people, yeah, I wish more people would just go back and actually read um, um, uh, Maxwell. So that's um, so the um, that's the last part. The more speculative part is um, and maybe some of the physicists um, can speak to this. I think that um, in certain circumstances, in certain circles, there's um, resistance to the idea that these kinds of considerations, which has to do with, uh, with an agent's abilities to store information or, or manipulate things, um, belongs in, in physics at all. The physics is supposed to be about the physical world. So I think that, um, um, and um, so I, I think that there is a temptation to, to um, want to make it purely a matter of physics. But also, don't, don't forget, um, 
that you know, there's certain when that you can measure the entropy change of, of, of things. Like, there's um, an awful lot of this is when you're dealing with with bodies at a macroscopic level. Um, an awful lot of this is insensitive to to um, small differences in what what you think that you can you can manipulate or me or measure stuff like that and a wide range and, and so, so you can more or less ignore that um, the fact that um, you are actually invoking some some such limitations now in certain circumstances like, so uh, there, 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 there also has, as Rob pointed out, there's been a, a steady stream of literature um, having to do with um, information processing in thermodynamics, stemming from Bennett and Landauer and stuff, and, and stuff like that. Um, but um, yeah, um, it hasn't been tied too closely to Maxwell. Yeah. yeah. So that's something you're talking, you mentioned that. <coughs> Uh, not only was thermodynamic entropy mean relative, yeah. but, but you thought that uh, a roughly epistemic interpretation of it was appropriate. Or at least, don't use the word subjective, but calling it epistemic is. I'd be happy with that, yeah. Um, so, do you, do you presumably see a big difference there, therefore, between the role of thermodynamic entropy and classical thermodynamics and quantum thermodynamics? Because if I ask about the, the free energy I can access in some system, uh, quantumly, right? so that's also given by you know, its mean energy and its entropy. Okay. But in this case, it'll be the von Neumann entropy in the system could be one half of an entangled pair. So you would presumably, because you believe the entangled okay. state is okay. on say that the reduced density operator on tick, so that the entropy can't yeah. be an epistemic okay. thing. So, so you have to have a, a radically different interpretation of thermodynamic entropy when it's quantum. Okay. Yeah, yes or no? Um, so, um, so it's relative. So it's relative to um, epistemic access you have in the system, but also which degrees of freedom that you have the ability to manipulate and and um, and control. Because information is not uh, not um, of any use to you if you can't do something with it. So if I've got say something in a pure state, but I only have act. But I, I can only manipulate one one half of an entangled pair. Well, then you know you're imposing in the um, this set of description. There, the, the, the big system is the whole entangled system in the pure state with with entropy zero. And but if you're saying I'm going to restrict your manipulations to to these degrees of freedom, then relative to that restriction, there's a reduced state of those degrees of freedom and hence an entropy associated with that. Also, um, I think even if you take an object view of the quantum state, um, an epistemic aspect or means relative, I'm not, I'm not quite sure I want what the right term, terminology is, because um, an awful lot of it is misleading. But, you know, um, if you think about, say, um, equilibration results, you involve some kind of prepar you know, um, preparation, and um, then you let the thing evolve. Um, you know, there's two sorts of results. There's, 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 there's theorems that might apply to all initial states and have a long-term averages. But we, if you're interested in a system you apply in the lab, um, you're interested in what's going to happen soon, and then you've got um, things that, that say, well, you know, unless you can prepare these ridiculously special states, you're going to have fairly rapid equilibration. And that has to do with um, a limitation on our ability to control the initial state of the thing, which, which, um, from which stems a limitation of our ability to have epistemic access to the um, uh, um, so I think that certainly question, you know, limitations about which degrees of freedom we have access to come into quantum thermo thermodynamics, even if epistemic access, uh, um, um, even if epistemic considerations don't. But I also think there's, a room, there's room for 
epistemic considerations in quantum thermodynamics too. Boltzmann is lots and lots of results and not as much reflection about the nature of, this, of, this, uh, of the, um, the science of statistical mechanics as one would like. So I don't, um, we can ask Yos about this. Um, Yos has actually read pretty much everything. I don't know if, you know, if, if any of you have ever delved into Boltzmann's writings. Um, first of all, most of it has been translated into English. And second, the, you know, you know, you, you know um, he's awfully long-winded. And there'll be papers where you've got you know, something of interest um, for a fresh view interspersed among, um, among long, tedious um, um, calculations. So that's why you need people like Yosu think to read everything and tell the rest of us what the interesting parts are. Um, but yeah, we, we, there's um, not as m I don't know of anything like the passages that I quoted in, in Boltzmann where he's stepping back and talking about the, you know, the nature of the subject of statistical mechanics and how does it um, motivate us to reconceive these thermodynamic quantities. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you could expand a little bit on your last remarks in your response to Rob about the epistemic aspect of the quantum case. You said that there was more you could say about that, and I think it would be nice to hear a little bit more. We started a bit late, so feel free to take about three more minutes. Oh, yeah, the first time. Um, yeah, I think we started, we started about five minutes late. So. Okay. Oh, oh, there is time. <laughs> um, so the abil your ability to um, say extract work from a, a system in a given quantum state um, does depend on what, on what you know about the quantum state. And we can often entertain um, the fic a fiction that we can reliably prepare a given system in a, in a given pure state. But as a matter of fact, there, you know, in the actual world, there's, there's, a, there's a, um, a, a, um, a, a bit of wiggle room. And, and I think that is relevant to the question about whether yeah, you know, whether it's true that say you know energy is being dissipated and um, and things are are heading towards um, um, equilibrium because um, the reversibility argument applies just as well in quantum mechanics as in, in classical mechanics. So there are you know there are systems that. You know, um, you know, so if I can, so if I, um, if you've got a system, um, and what people often do is, um, you know, treat system plus environment in a pure state, and then track the evolution of the, the of of the. Um, you know, track the evolu evolution of the reduced state of, of, the, of, of the system towards equilibrium and show that given weak assumptions about the nature and environment of the interaction, we get equilibration. Now, that can't possibly be true of arbitrary initial states of system and environment because for any evolution that goes one way, there's, there's a possible evolution that goes the other way. And so what we, you typically do is say, well, um, where you start the system and the environment in a factorizable state, no correlations between them, and then correlations get, get, get built up. Um, of course, there is 
you know, system and environment. You know, they, they're part of the same universe they have been for a long time. There's things that are co common past. Do we really stri stri strictly think that there are no correlations between the state of system and environment? No, what we do is we think that, okay, any correlations that, that, that there might be have been so distributed in the environment that they're useless to us. We're, gonna, we're just going to ignore that. So I do think that there is a role for this, the question of which, you know, which degrees of freedom, which, what, how much can we know about this, the, the, the state of system and environment? does have an effect on what we can do with it as a, as a re re resource. Are there people in the room who, 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 who can say more about this than, 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 um, um, than, than I can? I think we should go to the coffee break. Okay. So let's